people around this time of year decide to take a family picture? Raise your hand. Okay, six people. All right, I thought it'd be more. We always try to take a family picture this time of year. I'm going to show it to you right here. Look at this good-looking family, huh? Huh? Yes, yes. Okay, now, this is our, you know, family picture. And, and we try to do, when you do a family picture, you try to get it perfect, right? You try to get everybody lined up. You try to get the colors right, make sure everybody's smiling and so on and so forth. And it takes a little bit of doing, right? What you see in this picture is just a snapshot. Now, what I figured out, though, from looking on the internet is we don't really know how to take a family picture in, in my family. There are better examples. For example, take a look at this one. Now, that's a family photo, don't you think? I don't know where you could buy all those sweaters like that. Yes, that's ugly sweater, ugly sweater family right there. Okay, maybe this one's a better example. Take a look at this, huh? It's the football team family. I think he has one, two, three, four, five daughters there. That's why he's wearing a football jersey. Uh, take a look at this next one here. <laughs> it's like, I got an idea. Let's go sit in a tree. <laughs> Awkward. How about this next one? Okay, the plaid family. What I love about this one is we got plaid shirt, plaid shirt, plaid shirt, plaid shirt, plaid pants. See that? There's always somebody in the family that's got to be different. Do we have another one? Oh! Oh! Right? Business in the front, party in the back. This is the uh, mullet family. And uh, I love the little kid there. Like, he'll look back on that and appreciate it. Let's take a look at the next one. Oh, ninja family. I don't know whose idea this is, and that kid's going to grow up with some issues. Okay, I think we have one more. Oh, no, we have two more. This is crossbow family. Yeah, I should have thought of that for us. One more. Okay, now this is a good family photo, isn't it? And you look at this family photo, and you're like, look how perfect it is. Look at the light just shining, just sort of peacefully up on their faces and look at how comfortable the baby looks there and there's animals there but I'm sure they don't smell bad at all and they haven't gone to the bathroom anywhere in there right I mean that's a perfect family photo except it's not reality is it see that's the challenge sometimes your family photo it's just a snapshot of a point in time when you've done everything to try to get everything just so perfect but the reality is in the families is it's not often very perfect. This scene, I'm sure, in reality, was much, much different and not nearly as nice looking as that. That nativity photo seems perfect, but it's not reality. And the truth is, in our families, we want our families to be perfect. We want to portray ourselves as being perfect, but the reality is far from that. Here's my goal today. We're going to look at three snapshots of Jesus' family. And then we're going to draw comparisons to some of the things that go on in our family. And the goal will be to see what we can learn. And we'll do this on two levels. We'll do this on the level of our earthly human families. How many of you here, you're with your earthly family right here? Okay, good, good, good. But we're also going to look at how this plays into our spiritual family right? The body of believers. How many of you are here with your spiritual family? Okay, you should all raise your hands there, right? Now, we go to this section of scripture, Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, and you know, you may have heard this many, many times. Every time it's Christmas time, you hear this passage uh, and passages like it, but let's just look at this closely. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 and it says, now the birth of Jesus took place in this way when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Now, the Bible says that Mary and Joseph were betrothed. So you know what that means. Let me explain it like this. In our culture now, the marriage process usually looks something like this. A young man will usually, uh, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, 
propose, thank you. <laughs> a young man will propose to a young lady and they become engaged if she, she says yes. And so you've got an engagement and then you've got marriage. Well, maybe you have like dating, engagement, and then marriage. But in the first century here, you had something in the middle of the engagement and the marriage, and that was called the betrothal. Now, the betrothal was almost like marriage. It was a contractual obligation. The dowry had been paid from the woman's family to the man's family, and that set up this idea of betrothal, which they were husband and wife, but just not in the physical sense. Now, if you don't know what I mean, ask your parents later. Okay, and so that's why Joseph is actually called her husband, because they were betrothed. They were committed to each other. And when she was found to be pregnant, this looks really, really bad because she's legally obligated to Joseph. This is the equivalent of adultery. And this is a controversy, a controversy in the family of our Lord Jesus Christ. And guess what? Just like Mary and Joseph had controversy in their family, every family has some amount of controversy. Now, in this case, it would have been a huge, embarrassing issue for the families. There would have been talking. There would have been finger-pointing. There would have been gossip. Oh, so juicy gossip. But when it comes to a controversy in a family, what makes the family strong is how they react to the controversy. When you have a controversy in your family, when there's issues where somebody could point or where they could gossip, where they could spread some kind of juicy information, your reaction will make or break the family. The question is, will you respond with anger or will you respond with grace? Look at verse 19. This is Joseph's reaction. And her husband Joseph, being a just man, means he was fair, and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Now, you should know that in this culture, he could have made a big deal about this. He could have put her to shame publicly in the town square. And even in the Old Testament, uh, uh, something like this would be a cause for stoning. But instead, Joseph, because he was a just man, the Bible says that he responded with grace and mercy and he was going to divorce her, but he was going to do it quietly to save her reputation. Now, it's important to remind you, Mary did nothing wrong. She did not have an affair. And an angel then came to Joseph at night and told him the dream. He said, listen, your wife is not pregnant because of any other situation except for the fact that she's special and the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit came upon her and the Holy Spirit has made her pregnant because she's called for something special. And so Joseph decides to take Mary as his wife. But know this, I'm sure there were people who didn't have the inside scoop or if they heard that story said, yeah, right. Oh yeah, right, that's ever happened before. And I'm sure there was finger pointing I'm sure there was gossip, and I'm sure that controversy continued in his family. And he reacted with grace and dignity and poise. So if there's controversy in the family of Jesus, there's got to be controversy in your family, right? I mean, it could be a lot of things. I don't know. It could be an unplanned pregnancy. How do you react to that controversy? In anger or grace? It could be an addiction. It could be an addiction that you feel has uh, uh, made your family, um, uh, that's hurt your family or torn your family apart, and caused other people to talk about you. How do you react to that addiction? Could be an affair that happened. I mean, it could be just about anything. I don't know what controversy is going on in your family, but I know families have them. The question is how to react to that controversy. However you react says a lot about your character. I know one thing. We all have a responsibility to react to other people in a certain way. 
because we can either choose to be the people who point fingers, we can choose to be the, the people who gossip, or we can choose to be the people who respond with grace. Here's what the Apostle Paul says about it in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2. He says, With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. As you are in this room with other people, you may know of situations in their family that have been controversial. The question is, how do you react? In love? Now, let's fast forward 12 years. We're going to go forward two books of the Bible to the book of Luke. Go to Luke chapter 2 with me, please. Luke chapter 2, and we'll be in that verse 46. Now, while you're turning there, let me give you some background. Um, Mary and Joseph have 12-year-old Jesus, and they've gone to the Passover in Jerusalem. This was a big thing they would do every single year. Uh, it's sort of like Christmas, maybe times 10. And everybody would go for this huge celebration, and they would go to the temple, and it was a, it was a big deal. That was over now, and they were leaving the temple and going back home. And you know how it is sometimes if you've ever been in a large group, maybe like a church group or something, and uh, you see, you know, your child or, or um, uh, uh, you know, your family and, and they're leaving and you see them leaving with somebody. So you figure, oh, okay, they're fine. And they're, they're all moving away. And what happened was Joseph and Mary lost track of Jesus, but they figured it was not a problem because maybe they figured he was with somebody that they knew. But what happened is, as they get a little ways away, about a day away, they realize, we can't find Jesus. And they start looking all over for him. Have you ever been in that situation as a parent? Where all of a sudden you realize, like, wait a minute, I can't find my child. So they go back to Jerusalem, and they're looking all around. And the Bible says they looked for three days. Would you be panicked? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's no cell phones. I think you probably realize that. But they couldn't just look him up on Friend Finder or text him. They had to look everywhere. Have you seen Jesus? Have you seen Jesus? And finally, they find him. And look at verse 46 in chapter 2. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? I bet you there's been some moms in here that have said that to their kids. Why are you doing this to me? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And this is the greatest answer. Jesus says to him, Why were you looking for me? Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? They had no idea what was going on. What we have here is a failure to communicate. And if there was miscommunication in the family of Jesus, then there's probably miscommunication in your family sometimes. Every family has some miscommunication. Kind of reminds me of that movie Home Alone. How many of you watched that movie? You remember their drive? She's in the airplane, and all of a sudden she goes, Kevin! <laughs> and they have to go back and get their child. She'd go to jail now if that happened, but <laughs> somehow Jesus gets left behind. And, and I assume, what I assume about Jesus is he's not panicked. He is the creator of the universe after all. And he says, well, I'm just going to stay maybe in the last place they saw me, or I'm going to go to the place that I would expect they would look for me. And so he goes to the temple and he's talking with the rabbis, and he's asking them questions, and the answers that they go back and forth are, are blowing their minds. Can you imagine what this would be like? Not realizing that you're talking to, you know, you're talking to a 12-year-old boy, but you're talking to, you know, the one who created everything. You know, when it comes to holidays, a lot of miscommunication in our family sort of comes to the forefront. It brings out long-standing issues in the family. The way I put it like this is, a lot of times the holidays don't cause the problems, but the holidays are sort of a magnifying glass for the problems. 
So like, for example, if your family doesn't get along, say, politically, hello, you're all going to be forced in that one little room, and who knows what comes up, politics and miscommunication, or maybe it's something about finances, maybe your brother-in-law owes you some money, or maybe you owe your parents some money, and now you're sitting there across the table, and you say, could you please pass me the cranberries? And your dad says, could you please pay me back? Who knows what it is? It could be, um, you know, disagreements or miscommunication over race. It could be miscommunication or disagreements over spiritual beliefs. That's a reality. Because maybe your parents don't believe and you do, or maybe you believe and your parents or your children don't believe, or, you know, and you get into those conversations and this miscommunication just comes out. So the question is, well, what do you do about that? What can you do? I mean, it's your family. You have to get together at Christmas. Well, if the problem is miscommunication, then the solution is definitely what? Communication. Good, clear communication. What I want to do is offer some suggestions right from the Bible on clear communication with your family. And this should be pretty practical, so I would write it down. Three steps. Here's the first thing when it comes to communication. Do it quickly. If a rift arises or there's a challenge in the family or there's a miscommunication or there's some uh, amount of friction, don't wait. Deal with it right away. Let me put a scripture up on the screen. This is Ephesians 4.26. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. So basically we're saying is, is it's, it's easy to get angry and it's maybe impossible to avoid it, but the key is don't let the sun go down on your anger. So if you're sitting there at the dinner table or you got, just got done uh, opening presents and here is that rift that's coming up, whether it's about politics or race or money or anything, deal with it directly. Deal with it right away. Because when you put it off, it just sort of like festers and becomes a big issue. And then the next year, it's worse, but you don't talk about it. And the next year, it's worse, and it just goes on and on. And what happens is it creates this divide between you and whoever you've got this rift with. So deal with it quickly. Here's the second thing. Deal with it in person. Face-to-face -face is best when there's a problem. Now, I know that it might be easier for you to just text somebody but that's a terrible idea when there's conflict. And the reason it's a terrible idea is because when you text, that person will read your text in the voice they have of you in their head, which is probably not favorable if they're upset with you. Don't email, and please don't post it on Facebook for everybody to see. That only makes it worse. Do it in person. I suppose over the phone is... Maybe an option if you're far away. But when you deal with something like this, what's important is that somebody can hear your voice, that they can see your face, that they can hear the grace in your voice as you either apologize or ask for forgiveness. And when they hear that and when they see your face and when they see your body language in humility coming before them, that means a great deal. There's a whole section of this, and I'll just, you just jot this down. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20, Jesus basically gives a model for dealing with something or dealing with a person that you feel has sinned against you. And he's speaking of uh, believers first, but there's a, a principle that works in all situations. You go directly to that person and just make your case and do it gently and do it in love. That's our last thing. The last step is do it in love. This is not a, a time for you to, uh, I told you so. This is not a time for you to ram your vantage point or your viewpoint down somebody else's throat. This is your opportunity to do something in love. Let me put another scripture up for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. Now, most of the time we hear this passage at weddings. But truthfully, it doesn't have a whole lot to do with weddings. This is about believers getting along with each other. Let me read it for you. It says, love is what? Patient, Patient. and what? Kind. kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. 
It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or, what's your Bible say? Resentful. Resentful. You know what that, that's, that's like, it doesn't keep score. In the King James, it says, keeps no track of wrongs. Sometimes we'll go to somebody and you'll say, you know, I'm frustrated. I, I know you're frustrated with what I did, but I want to tell you what you did these six or seven times ago. That's resentful. That's keeping a track of wrongs. It says, it does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endure all things. Love never ends. So when there's conflict and miscommunication in your family, here's my suggestion to you. Handle it as quickly as possible. Handle it in person and do it in love. So here's my question. Who do you need to go to and start to get things right in your family? Who do you need to apologize to or who do you need to ask for forgiveness to? While families can make holidays challenging, guess what? Families also make holidays great. So, who is it that you need to talk to? It's December 13th. You have 11 days to make it right. Take care of it before Christmas. Now, what about the spiritual family? Do we ever have miscommunications in this spiritual family? No. <laughs> Not here we don't. Of course we do. We're human. We might disagree on all kinds of things. Again, political things, COVID things, whether to wear a mask or not, race, certain beliefs of the Bible. There are things we are going to disagree about. Hey, the same rules apply. Handle things quickly. Handle them in person and do it in love. And you know, you may say, you know what, Phil, I, I've I've had this issue with this person for a long time. I've done that. I've talked to them. I've apologized. They won't, you know, apologize to me or they won't forgive me. They won't listen to me. Well, sometimes that happens too. People are imperfect and they have free will. But here's the deal. Have you done what God has required of you? If so, put it in his hands. Put it in his hands. Now, let's fast forward 20 years and one more book of the Bible. This is the book of John, chapter 7. And uh, this is interesting because we've actually covered this. The last few weeks it's come up. So I just find it interesting that uh, we continue to be reminded about this. But... Uh, Jesus is beginning his ministry here and he's been doing some miracles but he's been staying away from a very specific place in Judea because uh, in Judea they wanted to kill him. And, um, and Jesus says uh, this, look at, look at this here. Um, now the Jews' feast of booth was at hand so his brother said to him, leave here and go to Judea that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. So it's like you think, okay, these are Jesus' brothers. First of all, some of you may be floored, like, what? Jesus had brothers? I didn't know that. Yeah, he did. He had half-brothers. Now, I know if, you're, if you were raised in the Catholic Church, that's somewhat controversial because they don't believe Mary had any other children, but the Bible is very clear. She did. Jesus had half-brothers and even some half-sisters. His brothers here, he had brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, not the bad Judas, but a different Judas. They said, hey, if you're trying to gain recognition, don't stay here in this little town. Go to the big town. But then you realize their motive because in the very next verse, verse 5, it says, For not even his brothers believed in him. That blows me away. How did his own brothers not believe that he was the Messiah? It makes me wonder if maybe Jesus didn't do any miracles when he was younger. Maybe he kind of held back on his power until his ministry started. If I know anything about siblings, they probably resented him. They were probably resentful. We do know that Jesus was perfect. So imagine having a brother who's literally perfect. So when, when your mom says, why can't you be more like Jesus? It's like saying, why can't you be more like God? 
And it's easy to be resentful towards a sibling because maybe they get more attention or they do things better or whatever it is. They didn't feel like they could measure up. And if there was some doubt in Jesus' family and some resentment, well, there's got to be some doubt in your family. Every family has some doubt. Every family has some resentment. I don't know what it looks like. It could be jealousy. It could be resentment. It could be bitterness. Maybe you feel like an outcast in your family, like you never fit in. Again, if it's because of a miscommunication, those three steps, I would say go and take care of those. But you know, the truth is sometimes it's much bigger issues. It's things that have been said to you over and over and over again that have affected your self-esteem and made you feel less than valuable. And you try to figure out, why is it so hard to deal with family? Why do I have to go through so much? Well, I want to share one last scripture with you. And um, this is just fascinating because First, I have to find it. My pages are stuck together here. If you've ever wondered, like, why do I have to go through these difficulties? Why do I have to go through these struggles? Listen to what this says. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. That's like perseverance. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be complete, lacking in nothing. Here's the thing. It could be that God has allowed those challenges into your life because he's building something in you. He's preparing something in you. And it's not that he's made your family do this to you, but the world has sin in it and people act the way they act. But God does use those difficult things to build you up and to strengthen you. And if you feel like you can't deal with it, the Bible says all you got to do is ask. Check this out. He says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to them. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Does anybody know who wrote these words? James, the brother of Jesus, the one who doubted. The one who didn't believe in him said, hey, sometimes you go through some difficult things. Those are good things because God's working something out in you. And if you lack anything, if you need the wisdom to deal with it, ask God and do it without doubting. He knew about doubting. He doubted his own brother. But later, he became a believer, a follower of Christ, and the pastor in Jerusalem. The truth is, God can overcome any doubt. Amen? God can overcome any miscommunication. He can overcome any controversy. That's his specialty, especially in families. All through the Bible, there are messed up families that God uses and works with. Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Noah, Abraham, David, and even Jesus' family had some problems. Now, Jesus was perfect, but his family wasn't perfect. And I expect that yours isn't either. But that's okay. Our families are what make the holidays special. And even our spiritual family, like the one you belong to here at LifePoint. So glad that you are here today, and I hope you have a wonderful Christmas this year with your family and your family here at LifePoint. Let's pray.